Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Paul Fiddler. Um, I'm a technical solution specialist at Cisco Meraki. And I'm going to take you through how we can secure devices, how you can use some of the tools in the um, previous session. Um, but also, I'm going to challenge what security actually means on a mobile device, whether that be a desktop or a handheld device. Um, I'm going to be quite unreasonable about that challenging as well, because I want to make sure that, um, as it says on the front here, that we, we really do keep not just children safe, uh, but also staff, the data, and everything else as well. So there is a journey to that fully secured device nirvana. And the first place to start is with visibility. You guys have probably seen uh, a ton of different dashboards today, which is great. And that visibility really is a key point in, in starting this journey. The next is actually securing the devices. And we can do this in multiple ways with multiple tools. And lastly, the most important thing is proactive action. So not sitting in front of a dashboard, looking at all of your devices and applications and seeing if there are vulnerabilities, but being alerted to the fact that something has happened and letting the tools automatically have an action to fix that or even to take the device off the network, to block the device, to put the device into a mode where um, it can't be used, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll look at that shortly. So visibility is key. Um, I know some of you use Meraki for your networks. I know that some of you use lots of other different products as well. But one of the, one of the great things that we get with Systems Manager is the network device, the physical device on the network, the user, and the, the device that's actually in the user's hands as well. That attribution is really, really key. Because if you're going to take action on a device, you need to know which device that actually is. Now, obviously, with the tools that you've just seen, uh, you can take actions to block the device from that application level, which is great. You can block it from the, the network level as well. But one of the great things with Meraki and Systems Manager is that as well as just seeing all of the devices on the network in the top there, you get to see which of your devices are actually managed as well on the network. And it's a single click to then take you through, to see the applications installed, et cetera, et cetera. So that visibility is, is key just from a physical device perspective. However, when the device is actually managed, we get much greater visibility of what's going on on the device. Now, you guys are in a bit of a, 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 bit of a situation because, because we've had so many threats to privacy on devices over the last few years. I'm not going to mention names. Um, the operating system vendors are making the devices more and more privacy-centric. So from an application perspective, that visibility that you're getting to see on devices, especially from a mobile device perspective, is decreasing. So you need something which is going to give you privileged access to that device. Now at the moment, and for the foreseeable future, the only thing that's going to give you that, again, especially on mobile devices like Android, iOS, iPad, etc., is MDM. Um, we, we are starting to see, well, we're not starting to see, it's been happening for a few years. MAC address randomization, for example, uh, happened about four years ago and has already um, hit the industry from a, from a visibility perspective. So whilst we've got privileged access to that device using MDM, we might as well use it. We get to see all sorts of uh, unique identifiers on the device. Um, so, for example, Bluetooth MAC addresses, uh, we've got both LAN public IP addresses, serial numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Quite a lot of information in there. If you do have devices which have SIM cards in them, you get to see the phone number being used on that SIM card. You get to see the serial number of the SIM card as well. We get to see applications installed. I think that's a given. 
certificates, profiles. Now, profiles is quite important. The reason being is Apple added a little bit of friction with the installation of a profile outside of MDM, uh, probably around five or six years ago. And the reason for this is because in the US, Apple were having a huge issue with end users inadvertently installing spam email accounts on their device via profiles. They were calling Apple and saying, hey, I'm getting a ton of spam on my device, but on no other device. So that visibility to see which profiles are installed is key as well. Another use case for that might be that somebody has inadvertently installed um, a certificate profile allowing for man in the middle attacks as well. So that visibility is absolutely key. And lastly, again, I mentioned cellular usage. Um, I've recently been writing a guide on how to save um, expenses when using SIM cards. Um, so the ability to take action on the device is quite critical. What we can't see, and this is really important, we can't see user accounts, photos, usernames, passwords, and how applications are being used. Uh, this is especially true of web browsers as well. There's a ton of other capabilities that you have. I note that LGFL have a DNS uh, capability that you can leverage, which would give you that information. But if you do have users who rightly are concerned about their privacy, then you can tell them that you can't see um, all of the private information that's on the device. So how do we go about securing? We've got visibility of the device now. We've got physical visibility on the network. We've got visibility of the managed device as well. But securing, how do we do this? Well, the first thing is that we can hide things. It's really tempting to um, go to the App Store and install applications if the App Store is actually there on the device and you can log into it. So we can hide applications. Now, the key thing here is that on the different operating systems, how that manifests itself is a little different. On Apple, you have to hide applications. On Android, the applications are automatically hidden when you first enroll the device. So we have to enable apps. And depending on how you view things, one might be better than the other. But the great thing about the Android one is that by default, applications are hidden. So you're not having to play whack-a-mole. Oh, look, there's a new application on the device. I have to hide it. Um, with Apple, However, you get a standard set of applications with each OS update, so you know exactly which apps you can hide as well. And there are other less secure kind of use cases for this as well. Um, for example, uh, we'll get to content filtering in a minute, but if you want to ensure that children are not cheating in exams, you can hide the calculator application. So there's a million different use cases as to why you'd want to hide apps. Um, as I mentioned, we can also um, prevent users from adding their own accounts. And lastly, which is one of the biggest threats to Android, we can also prevent the sideloading of applications where users go to a website or they put a SD card into their phone or whatever. We can prevent that as well. Now, we've hidden apps. That's great. We can now start to restrict the device. And there's so many different ways that we can do this. As you can see, we've got some simple Android restrictions up there, the ability to uh, prevent usage of the camera, all sorts of different things, which is great. We can prevent widgets being seen on the, on the screen as well. So when the device is locked, you can prevent information, which might be privileged, being shown as well. And lastly, we've got things like Android app permissions. So you might have a valid use case to use WhatsApp, for example. But what you don't want is for users to be able to um, use the camera in WhatsApp. The great thing about Android is we can actually do that. We've got that fine level of control over the device that you can allow an application that might be a threat like WhatsApp, but prevent the application from making phone calls or uh, getting location or camera usage like that. 
Now, from a best practices perspective, I would, I, I thought long and hard about this. My background is enterprise architecture and mobility in Cisco managing 65,000 mobile devices. And we often start because we classify every, every mobile device as a bring your own device, as a personal device. So we start there with having no restrictions and slowly turning things on. Because you don't want to get into the way of productivity. But from a fully managed device, from uh, what we call a corporate owned, uh, personally enabled device, it's probably better to start really restrictive and then turn things on. The reason for that, it's much easier to increase productivity by removing a restriction than it is to then add a restriction and get in the way of productivity. And the other thing I really do advise is to have a plan, to sit down and without looking at the, the Meraki dashboard, have a think about the use cases that you want to fix with systems manager, with managing devices. Have a think about the issues that you might have from a usability perspective, from a productivity perspective, and from a security perspective as well. It's really easy to look at all of those restrictions and go tick, 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 and get so far in the way of productivity that users, students, staff don't even bother using the device. It ends up in a cupboard somewhere, which we see quite often in the industry. Now, we've secured the device. We've put applications on there like antivirus products, for example. We've enabled firewalls. We've um, restricted the device so the user can't use a camera. Um, all sorts of things like this. What we need, however, is a way to measure the success and the compliance of that device. And we do that with um, PIN policies. This is the start of this journey of really starting to protect the device. All we've done at the moment is just prevented the user from doing a few things. But if this device was to get left somewhere um, or it ended up in the wrong hands, we need to make sure that miscreants can't get hold of the data that's on there. Now, as I mentioned right at the start, devices are absolutely everywhere. I can see you know, on the various tables, I can see multiple devices. Um, I have more devices at home that I can shake a stick at. Absolutely tons. But on every single one of them, they have a different pin policy, which uh, for somebody of my age is really difficult to remember a lot of the time. But the great thing is, is that that device is secure, just with a pin policy. And I know that the complexity of a password does get in the way an awful lot of the time. But it, it is absolutely critical that there is a pin on a device. And the reason for that is because a lot of the time, credentials like Wi-Fi credentials are stored in secure elements on the device or uh, the keychain on a Mac, for example. And I don't know if you've noticed, when you turn an iOS device on and you get to the pin right at the start, you'll notice that you're not on Wi-Fi. You're not on Wi-Fi because that keychain, that place that stores all of those usernames and passwords, is not available to the operating system until you log in. So that already is a really good way of ensuring that the device stays secure. Because if you can't get on Wi-Fi, those usernames and passwords are not available to everyone as well. And I know that this sounds really, really simple and teaching you guys to, to suck eggs, obviously. But you'd be surprised at just how lax uh, some of my customers are with simple things like pin policies. Content filtering, um, we've, we've spoken about a little bit with DNS, for example. But we're still in a situation where people are working from home, where people are studying from home, where people are taking exams from home, etc. And we've got some really good rudimentary capabilities on the operating systems themselves. So for Android, we can use managed app configs, for example, to manage the Chrome application. And it is really simple to block every single URL from Chrome, regardless of the bearer that the user is on. Now, you're probably thinking, well, the, the students at school, they're, they're going to be on Wi-Fi, so 
Why is this a problem? Well, you can just as easily stick a USB-C adapter with Ethernet on the bottom or connect it to a hotspot of a different device and that network content filtering has just gone. They're on a different bearer now. So we can do some simple content filtering just using Chrome Managed App Config. On iOS, we've got the ability to do some very rudimentary content filtering as well. And the great thing about this on iOS is that because every web browser uses WebKit, it doesn't matter which web browser the user is using, that content filtering will work on iOS regardless, which is quite cool. And lastly, down in the bottom, we've got Chromebook content filtering as well. So even from a really simplistic perspective, we can stop good people going to bad places. However, and I make apologies for this, but because I know LGFL do offer a DNS service as well. The reason that it's up is because it's only recently that Apple have opened up the ability to manage DNS on an iOS device. Uh, they started with just Cisco probably around eight years ago. Um, and you had to have a fully supervised device to set DNS on the device. And it was only using Cisco's umbrella to do that. However, they've opened this up now so that for BYOD devices or devices which are brought under management after they have been set up, you can do DNS filtering on them. Now, the great thing about this is if you leverage the service from LGFL or if you leverage it from Cisco or from somebody else, it doesn't matter which bearer the, the user is on. They will always be protected if you set the DNS actually on the device. And we can do this for both mobile devices and laptops as well. The other great thing about this is with the rudimentary content filtering that we had earlier, it's whack-a-mole. You're constantly having to reevaluate all of those rules. By using the LGFL DNS or umbrella, you're having security organizations manage that for you. The great thing is, is that you don't have to block websites. You can block categories of websites. So again, that reduces the burden of management and administration on you guys. So my, dice, my devices are managed and therefore the secure. All right? I'm hoping that that's the message that you came into here with because I'm going to challenge that. Yeah, I see somebody shaking his head already. That's good to know. Um, they're only secure if you take action. If you rely on the tools to secure the device, that's great. But no tool is infallible. Regardless of the amount of effort that you put into securing a device, there will be a vulnerability. There will be a use case there will be some very clever student or member of staff who gets in the way of that. So what we need is a plan. And as I mentioned, this is a journey. We have the capability in Systems Manager for something called a security policy. And a policy is literally just a set of criteria that you use to measure if a device is secure or if it's not secure. And again, start with a blank piece of paper. Don't even look at the technology. Start with a blank piece of paper and think about what a secure device actually means to you. Then we can look at the security policy and you'll, set, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of different things in there. I've kind of copied Cisco's own internal security policy, which is based on nine different things like the ability to uh, bring the device under management, set a pin on the device. Um, it's running a particular version of the OS. It's checked in recently, uh, firewall, antivirus, and a couple of other things as well. And this is what you're going to use to measure the security of the device. Now, that security policy on its own doesn't really do anything. What it does is allows you to measure. So how do we measure that? How do we see devices which are compliant and which are not compliant? 
Well, we have an alerting capability. And as you can see, we've got the enterprise security policy in the top there. We can exclude subsets of devices. So if you're testing, we don't have false positives. And if a device fails compliance against that security policy, you can be alerted to the fact that that's happened. And the great thing is, because devices check in every 15 minutes or so, and the, the burden on your network is absolutely tiny, the average payload of a check-in is around 50 kilobytes. So even if you are checking in every 15 minutes or so, it's absolutely tiny. But we don't really want people to be emailed when something happens, because I personally um, keep really good control of my uh, inbox. I've got about 100 emails in there, but I realize you guys are astoundingly busy. So I don't want you to have to be checking email to see that something has happened. We have a capability called a webhook. Now, a webhook is really simple. It's an API call from Meraki to somewhere. And that somewhere, out of the box, can include WebEx, Microsoft Teams, Slack, ServiceNow, et cetera. But we use a capability, a standard, called Liquid, which was invented by a company called Shopify. And what this allows you to do is to go onto their website and find a template for whatever service management, case management capability you might be using, like Jira, whatever. You might even design your own. You can upload that. And where we have the little drop-down box that says service now, you can then pick your own endpoint. You put in the URL. You put in uh, the secure key that you're going to use. And when something happens, like the enterprise security policy breaking compliance, that API call is sent somewhere so you can investigate or you can trigger a policy change in one of the many tools that LGFL give you. Now, what that is really does depend on your use case, but it's the fact that we have privileged visibility of the device which allows us to see stuff that other applications and capabilities can't. Now, the other thing that we can do, you've been alerted to the fact that something has happened. We can also get Systems Manager to do things for you as well. Now, if you've ever looked at the settings page, um, you created a new setting or you've created a new application, you might be familiar with the targets bit. Now, pretty much all of my customers, where it says scope, says all devices. So this restriction is gonna be sent down to all devices by default, all this application, this account, et cetera. But what we can do is we've got our enterprise security policy violating devices in there. And these tags, these labels that we use are automatically created for you. So when a device falls foul of that security policy that you've created, we can take action. Systems Manager will then contact the device and apply whatever policy or remove whichever policy you've applied to the device. Really good use case for this, which is not a security one, but was actually uh, based on mobile phone usage, was that a customer of mine wanted to stop users from using their device when they'd gone over one gigabyte of data. Now, they're not in the UK. They're in um, Central Asia somewhere where we don't gorge ourselves on, on mobile data. So literally within 15 minutes of a user going over that, we put the device into single application mode so the user could only use email from that point on. And you can do the same thing here. If something happens, you can remove an account. You can remove a setting, a policy, um, an application, or you can add something to the device as well. What you do is completely up to you, but it's the fact that you can make changes on the device proactively without you having to be sat in front of a dashboard. So I hope that I've taken you through a little bit of a journey with regards to how we can get to that secure device nirvana. Visibility is absolutely key. You need to know what's out there. And I, I understand that a lot of schools are still not using MDM. We can secure the device. We can put policies, applications, settings, pin codes, et cetera, on the device, which mitigates a lot of the risks. But we can take action. 
we can take action automatically using the tagging capability in Systems Manager, using the alerts, but also to notify external capabilities that you might have to then go and investigate what has happened as well. And lastly, that's not the end of the journey. This is only the start of it. I, this is not a lesson in how to secure devices. This is just a, a, the start of that journey. It, it really is. And you need to keep coming back to this. I know some of you join the um, quarterly training sessions that we have. And I'm going to start um, adding more of a security focus to them. So again, you guys don't have to be sat in front of a dashboard looking at devices. You can use the tools to proactively take action on them. I hope that's been useful. I hope I've challenged some, some beliefs that you might have, and I hope I've inspired you to look at some of the other capabilities that we have as well. 